I think because I had the longest title of the four breakouts, we got the big screen. So um, we're going to unpack that title in a minute. But uh, first, just let me say what a, my wife Patty's with me here. She's out there somewhere. There she is. Um, what a warm, generous, gracious welcome we've had in Australia. We've been here, I don't know, eight or nine days. And uh, it's really been delightful to be in Melbourne and Brisbane. and and interacting with practitioners. So uh, thank you for that. Really, really appreciate that. Today, we're going to talk about uh, the narrative identity and the constricted imagination, the developmental approach to um, kind of the challenges at midlife. And, and the corollary of that is obviously the challenges then from a leadership perspective. Uh, that's obviously a big mouthful. So let's unpack that title a bit. What, what do we mean by? narrative identity. If you look at uh, sort of the history of personality psychology over the years, personality psychology has been around since the 30s. Uh, there are three main branches of it. The first branch was trait psychology. So that's basically, in a nutshell, what, are, what is a person like in general, right? So their traits. The second piece of that is um, what you might think of as characteristic adaptation. So what's a person like sort of in context? So or more specifically, I think of the leadership circle, for instance, as an instrument in that genre of characteristic adaptation, because it's a snapshot of a person in time, in context, in role, at a certain age, at a certain level of maturity, uh, at a certain set of business conditions. So in a sense, we're we're having a lens on how are they adapting in that particular moment or in that particular context. The third branch and the newest branch in personality psychology is, is narrative, narrative psychology. And we're going to talk specifically about narrative identity today. So what do we mean by narrative identity? Uh, kind of in its simplest form, narrative identity is a person's evolving life story. It's their reconstructed past combined with their experienced present and their imagined future. So those three components make up narrative identity. So through narrative identity, people convey not only to themselves, but to others who they are, how they've come to be that person, and their thoughts and imaginings about who are they going to be in the future. So one way to think about it is, is those three components coming together. It's a curated past, right? I'm looking back at my episodic memories and selecting certain ones that have relevance to identity uh, that informs my experienced present. And that also informs my imagined future. So that's what we mean by narrative identity. There's been some really interesting research in the last 20 years. Uh, there's a guy named Dan McAdams at Northwestern University. Um, and what he's tracked from a research perspective is that uh, people that have uh, the capacity to sort of have themes of personal agency uh, as they look at these components of their narrative identity, so personal agency and exploration tend to have higher levels of uh, well-being, uh, less episodes of depression in later life, uh, and more generative maturity. So there's something going on there in these constructions of narrative that's important from a, a well-being perspective. So that's, that's narrative identity, that those three components. Let's, let's kind of take a chunk out of the next piece of that big title, uh, which is what do I mean by challenges in, in midlife? Uh, so one of the things that's interesting, if you begin to think about well, where do our narrative capacities show up developmentally in our lives. And they show up at about age 15. Uh, that's when we really begin to um, tell ourselves the story of ourself. Okay, again, we're starting to look back at the past, uh, pull out some, again, some episodic memories that inform the present uh, and help us to begin to imagine the future. So you might think about a teenager or a young adult saying they might be explaining a particular passion, something they really care about, um, as a turning point. They're going to frame it as a turning point. That's when 
you know, it was never the same after that. Uh, that's that's a, a way of beginning to think about, ah, okay, they're, they're curating the past, right? They're looking back and saying, there was an event in my life that had specific meaning for who I am today and probably relevance for who I'm going to be tomorrow. Um, so it's both an external dialogue as well as an internal one. It's, it's one of the ways we convey to others who we are, uh, but it's also the way we convey to ourselves who we are. So internal dialogue is the medium of narrative identity, and, and internal dialogue is the developmental capacity that starts happening in adolescence. That's when we really start talking to ourselves. And we talk to ourselves the rest of our lives, okay? So if, for instance, as, as I sort of observe my own self story over the years, um, the story always sort of starts the same way. It usually starts out with, when I was two years old, I fell out of a two-story window and landed on my head. <laughs> True story. And I usually follow up that up with another, of, uh, another series of, uh, you know, I fractured my skull when I was five when a garage door landed on my head. Uh, I fell off a bridge when I was six, landed on my head. Fell off of bleachers at age seven, landed on my head. Uh, but there you can see my autobiographical memory in action, and now you see sort of autobiographical reasoning sort of taking hold of that memory. And by that I mean, because when I, when I keep telling the story of who I am today, you know, I usually say something like, you know, I have kind of a expansive, deep, interiority. Um, I'm, uh, I've got a capacity for sort of stillness and observation. Um, I'm, I'm pretty patient and non-attached. Well, all of those capacities uh, are how I make my living. I've gotten paid for those capacities for three or four decades now, uh, whether it be a coach or a consultant or a therapist. Um, and those capacities took hold back in those early years when I was dazed and confused for several years. <laughs> right? uh, so the, the narrative logic in that story thread um, is me authoring self, right? I'm giving you a picture of me in the present because of the past, and you can already begin to infer maybe some of what the future might look like. Right? That's, again, narrative identity, right? Curated past. I didn't pick all the memories of my past. I picked some of them. I happened to pick these head injury ones that I come back to, right? Um, so there's a, there's a narrative logic to that, that story. So you might be wondering here if, if, if our narrative capacity, if our, if our capacity for authoring ourselves takes hold at about age 15, what, what's Robert Keegan talking about in terms of his stage four of adult development when he's talking about self-authoring, right? Well, we are all surrounded by what you might think of as master narratives, the master narratives of gender, class, race, age, politics, um, nationality, history. Those, those are the big stories in which our small stories are embedded in. So what Keegan's talking about in later life in this stage four shift is that's when the capacity emerges to begin to author self outside of or next to those master narratives. That's when we have more narrative agency and more narrative freedom. Uh, earlier than that, we tend to be embedded in those na master narratives, if that makes sense. So our capacity for authoring self starts pretty early in life. Uh, and then the, the, the stage four self-authoring that Keegan's talking about is something that happens later in life. So let's, let's shift our gaze now to sort of the, the other side of this age spectrum, this, this arc of, of human life. You can imagine at the end of life, you might have what you would think of as narrative closure, right? The end of our story making, the end of our identity making. Um, there's a, I'm going to read you a passage here in just a second. There's a, a, 
narrative uh, psychologist and researcher named Mark Freeman who coined the term narrative foreclosure. And by that he meant, and again, he was doing a lot of gerontology research, he meant that there were you know, old people sitting in these nursing homes all around the world, some of which have stopped telling themselves the story of their lives. Even though they're still living and breathing, they're basically just kind of warehoused, waiting to die. Um, and he, he wrote this about his mother, who was um, in sort of uh, the early stages of some dementia in a, an assisted living home, but hadn't yet kind of lost her capacity for narrative identity. And he, and, and he, and he says, old people with their walkers and their wheelchairs surround my mother. People sit in the lobby, slumped over, dozing, waking briefly when there are passers-by. Uh, some of them seem to have little to do, little left to live for. Their, their story is over, or at least that's how they see it. And part of the reason why they see it this way it may be linked back to that image of sort of a vital self. They are the inverted image of that self, sort of beyond vitality, beyond self-sufficiency. In some ways, my mother had su has suggested beyond personhood itself. She is vehemently not them. The nightly bingo that they play downstairs in open view really gets to her. Uh, at the end of the day, they're only, those are only mindless games, sort of camaraderie created by random numbers. Time for them is not to be lived, but passed. There's no story to be told after such days. They're just like the one before and the one before that. My mother sometimes seems to resent these non-persons and their non-stories. In her eyes, they've crossed the line and the image of them sitting there night after night is painful to behold. I suppose one could say that on some level they exist in the moment and it's quite possible they're less troubled by their existence than she is hers, but that's hardly an occasion for envy. So that, that's what he means by narrative foreclosure. That's the cessation of story making, the cessation of self making. Um, fortunately, now there are branches of, of medicine, literally called narrative medicine, that are focused on breaking sort of that coercive mythology of decline and helping them open self back up to an imagined and unknown future. Again, that third part of the narrative identity. So there's, there's the two ends of life, right? The beginning when that capacity takes hold, the end when we stop telling, them, telling ourselves the story of self. Let's talk now about the middle because this you know, piece today is really about the challenges of midlife. So what's going on in our story making in, in midlife that's uh, relevant? So one of the biggest story shifts at midlife, uh, you might think of as the, is the end of the identity project. And I, I take this language from Michael Washburn, sort of the transpersonal philosopher and, and psychologist. Um, so in adolescence, we try on a, a, a variety of selves, right? That's the provisional identity stage. Uh, those are all tentative identities. We're, we're swapping them out, trying to find self. Um, but as, as we grow into early adulthood, you know, 18, 19, 20, uh, with a growing kind of existential anxiety, we begin to embark on the identity project. This is a long-term identity project, Like right? we're, we're sort of developmentally tasked with creating an adult that's durable enough to survive, <laughs> right? Um, so we hook up our identity to domain of knowledge, career, college, work. Um, and it's a necessary and critical egoic structure. So the, the thing we don't catch in those early years is the, the implicit promise of that identity project uh, is that all will be well at the end of that project. So inevitably, at some time during midlife, still li living with that sort of egoic narrative identity, we begin to discover the emptiness of that promise. 
I say begin to discover because typically that reveal takes a while. Um, so our, our malaise, our boredom, our growing emptiness and frustration doesn't necessarily initially give rise to any cognitive insight, okay? but instead leads to a variety of coping mechanisms. And these are the kinds of things you may see, I've certainly seen a ton of in working with leaders, the first of which you might call restless diversion. Restless diversion is another hobby, another amusement, another adventure, a new car, a new house, a new spouse, right? Anything to distract the self from its growing anxiety, right? And when those outwardly focused distractions prove unhelpful in, in combating that anxiety, uh, the egoic self sort of turns inward and begins to have a particular kind of dialogue with itself. And that's usually of one or two forms. And, and that's also a form of inner diversion now versus exter, external diversion. Uh, the first part of that dialogue is usually a relitigating of the past, right? Because I'm not happy, I must have done something wrong. So I'm looking back at all the things, looking back at episod uh, episodic memory and saying, ah, I screwed that up, I screwed that up, I screwed that. That explains why I'm not happy. Uh, or it can be the reverse of that, sort of self-talk in the form of reassurance. I did everything right. I checked all the boxes, look at all my successes, right? Um, trying to pat myself on the back enough to you know, generate some happiness. In both of those cases, internal and external diversion, uh, the self is not yet able to see the fundamental flaw in the identity project itself, right? It's still caught within that structure and that story. So that the other typical coping strategies you see in this midlife constriction at the end of the identity project is what you might think of as narcissistic overdrive. We double down on the identity project, right? If we sold $10 million of business last year, well, this year we're gonna sell 20, because that's gonna make us happy, right? We double down on all of those basic structures of the identity project. So instead of beginning to let it go, uh, we grab it harder, okay? So here's Michael Washburn here, for instance. He says, if the identity project is not accomplishing what it promises, one response is to step up efforts in the project to make others take greater notice of one's being and value. That response is based on the hope that by trying harder, will thereby elicit a number of confirmatory responses uh, that are gonna kind of prove beyond any further doubt of one's existence and self-worth. So both restless and diversion and, and narcissistic overdrive are forms of flight. Indications the self is not yet ready to take on the root cause of its emptiness. And the, really the inherent fallacy in the identity project itself. So over time, with nothing to show for sometimes years of diversion, <laughs> and self-talk, the egoic self begins to run out of energy, begins to lose faith in the identity project itself. So without the anchoring promise of sort of happiness at the end of that project, uh, the self becomes vulnerable now to depression because the egoic self's best efforts have not made it happy, right? Uh, the depression starts to cycle in and out. The egoic self kind of resets itself, goes back into the identity project, keeps banging away, same outcome. Over time, that depression tends to bleed out into kind of a, uh, just a, a pervasive malaise about life in general. In, so, in, some, in some ways, it doesn't cycle anymore, it just sort of flat lines. So that becomes the self's outlook on the world, sort of regardless of the amount of external success that person may have created. That depressive outlook um, is not yet quite aware of its loss of faith in the project itself. 
Um, that, comes, that comes next when you begin to get a little reflective awareness of, wow, maybe this thing I've spent the last 30 or 40 years chasing is actually not <laughs> what I thought it was, right? Uh, and that's when you begin to get despair instead of depression because despair has insight in it. Um, so the developmental task now is for the self story to evolve past sort of those egoic roots in that original sort of adult narrative identity. So I tell you all that, I mean, we're still talking about the title here. Um, <laughs> I tell you all that as a way of potentially sort of helping you spot maybe these patterns as you're debriefing folks, coaching leaders, looking at their profiles. Um, maybe thinking about, oh yeah, what did, what did he say about restless diversion? See that a lot in executives. Uh, what about this narcissistic overdrive? Yep, <laughs> check, right? What about dep disp depression and, and despair sort of setting in? Um, those are all normal at the end of this journey, right? They're all symptomatic of the narrative identity's constriction at that point in life. Um, the egoic identity trying to hang on at the end of that project. So I've always loved this quote by, uh, by the poet Stanley Kunitz. It was in, the, I think it was back in the 80s, he was being interviewed by, uh, by Bill Moyers. Uh, and he said, for years I've been telling young poets that the first important act of imagination is to create the person who will write the poems. Uh, and that's not the end of it. We have to invent and reinvent who we are uh, until we arrive at the self we can bear to live and die with. Art demands of the artist the capacity for self-renewal. Uh, without it, art withers, and of course, so does life. So that's really what we're up to. Uh, and, the, and the final part of the title really is about this constricted imagination, right? Um, what do we mean by that? I mean, if you think about, for instance, David White's poem, Sweet Darkness, it, it concludes with the lines, you know, you must learn one thing, the world was made to be free in. Uh, give up all the other worlds except the one to which you belong. Sometimes it takes darkness and the sweet confineness of your aloneness to learn anything or anyone that does not bring you alive is too small for you. So sometimes we found we've written ourselves into a narrative corner. You know, our behavior rides sort of on deeply grooved neurology, right? Our behavior and cognition serve to reinforce our narrative identity that we spent 30 or 40 years creating. So that's the trap we get into is our behavior actually, yep, keeps telling us that's me, that's me, that's me. Uh, it serves a, a homeostatic role reinforcing the existing story of the self. So I'm gonna come back to this idea of two warring kinds of impulses, both sort of stasis and growth uh, that you find in these narrative identity shifts. But let me, let me give you some literary examples um, of these narrative identities uh, that you'll find probably will connect up with your experience of the leadership circle. The first one is, uh, from Edmund Morris's biography of the American president, Teddy Roosevelt. His biography is entitled uh, Theodore Rex. Although his physical courage was by now legendary, it was not a natural endowment. He'd been a timid child in New York City, cut off from schoolboy illness, uh, wealth, and private tutors. Inspired by his leonine father, he'd labored with weights to build up his strength. Simultaneously, he would built up his courage by sheer dint of practicing fearlessness. Uh, with every ounce of new muscle, with every point scored over pugilistic, romantic, and political rivals, his personal impetus, likened by many observers to be a steam train, had accelerated. Experiences had flashed by him in such a number that he was obviously destined to travel a larger landscape of life than were his fellows. He'd been a published author at 18, a husband at 22, an acclaimed historian and New York State Assemblyman at 23, a father and widower at 25, a ranchman at 26, a candidate for mayor of New York at 27, a husband again at 28, a civil service commissioner of the United States at 30, 
And by then he was producing book after book and child after child and cultivating every scientist, politician, artist, and intellectual of repute in Washington. His career gathered further speed. Police commissioner of New York City at 36, assistant secretary of the Navy at 38, colonel of the first US voluntary cavalry, the Rough Riders at 39. And at last in Cuba came the consummated crowded hour. A rush, a roar, the sting of his own blood, a surge toward the sky, a smoking pistol in his hand, a soldier in light blue doubling up neatly as a jackrabbit. When the smoke cleared, he found himself atop Kettle Hill on the heights of San Juan with a vanquished empire at his feet. I'm kind of exhausted just reading that. Um, but here you see the typical character strategies of controlling, right? The moving against strategies, forward motion, energy, accomplishment, achievement, relentlessness, victory, right? And you, you can begin to imagine back in early Teddy Roosevelt's life as a small, weak, sickly child, that character decision to not be small, to not be weak, to not be unimpressive, right? I'll give you another literary example here. This is from uh, James Joyce's short story, A Painful Case. It's a story of a solitary man who becomes enamored with a married woman. You can guess where this one's gonna go. So Mr. James Duffy lived in Chapel Lizard because he wished to live as far as possible from the city of which he was a citizen. His cheekbones also gave his face a harsh character, but there was no harshness in his eyes, which looking at the world from under their tawny eyebrows gave the impression of a man ever alert to greet a redeeming instinct in others, but often disappointed. He lived at a little distance from his body. Uh, regarding his own acts with doubtful side glasses, he had an odd autobiographical habit which led, led him to compose in his mind from time to time a short sentence about himself containing a subject in the third person and a predicate in the past tense. So here's this guy, he lives this solitary life. He's kind of an intellectual, he doesn't really have any friends. He goes to town to listen to music, goes to work as a cashier in a bank, comes home, reads his books, listens to some more Mozart. One night at a concert, he happens to sit next to a, a woman and her daughter. And they introduce each other, and it turns out she's this married woman married to a ship's captain, and her name is Mrs. Sinico. They strike up a conversation, and she's quite charming, and obviously appears to be interested in him. Uh, and this begins for him sort of an unusual friendship. Uh, they begin to meet for chaste and very polite conversation. At one point, months into the relationship, they're getting a little closer. He went off into her little college, out, a cottage outside Dublin. Often they spent their evenings alone. Little by little, as their thoughts entangled, they spoke of subjects less remote. Her companionship was like a warm soil about an exotic. Many times she allowed the dark to fall upon them, refraining from lighting the lamp. The dark, discreet room, their isolation, the music that still vibrated in their ears united them. This union exalted him, wore away the rough edges of his character, emotionalized his mental life. Sometimes he caught himself listening to the sound of his own voice. He thought that in her eyes he would ascend to an angelic stature. And as he attached the fervent nature of his companion more and more closely to him, he heard the strange impersonal voice, which he recognized as his own, insisting on the soul's incurable loneliness. We cannot give ourselves, it said, we are our own. So soon thereafter, after months of these uh, meetings, uh, one, of those, one of those nights she reached out gently and, and touched the side of his face, sort of a simple gesture of affection. 
Well, that, that simple gesture affected him so much and disturbed him so much, he cut off all relationships with her and never saw her again. Um, it was too close, too intimate, too wrong. So four years later, he's having his breakfast, reading the newspaper, having his coffee, and he reads in the, an article with the headline, Death of a Lady at Sydney Parade, a Painful Case and goes on to say that a woman was tragically hit by a train, and it turns out it was Mrs. Sinico. He's kind of overwhelmed by grief and emotion of all that he had walked away from, all that he had lost in his fear of intimacy and closeness. And at the end of, that at the, end of the short story, he's out for a walk one night along the river, kind of one of those soul-searching walks, He's glancing down among the trees by the river and he sees two lovers lying in the grass. Um, those venal and furtive loves filled him with despair. It gnawed the rectitude of his life. He felt he had been outcast from life's feast. One human being had seemed to love him and he had denied her life and happiness. He had sentenced her to ignominy, a death of shame. So here again, you can see early character choices forming up, right? You see how the heart of this identity formed up around separateness, around autonomy, around resisting the urge towards intimacy. Uh, you hear the choice to be a character, uh, to not be vulnerable, not be known or open. And all the associated strategies of which you all are very familiar with in that protecting space, right? The moving away from strategies. Okay, so final example. This is from a Virginia Woolf essay she wrote back in 1942. It was she who used to come between me and my paper when I was writing reviews. It was she who bothered me and wasted my time and so tormented me that at last I killed her. You who come of a younger and happier generation may not have heard of her, may not know what I mean by the angel in the house. I will des describe her as shortly as I can. She was intensely sympathetic. She was immensely charming. She was utterly unselfish. She excelled in the difficult arts of family life if there was a chicken, she took the leg. If there was a draft, she sat in it. She, in short, she was so constituted that she never had a mind or a wish of her own, but preferred to sympathize always with the minds and wishes of others. I turned upon her and caught her by the throat. I did my best to kill her. My excuse, if I were to be held up in a court of law, was that I acted in self-defense. Had I not killed her, she would have killed me. So here you see, obviously, the familiar character structure of complying, right? The giving away of power, the unselfish acts, the continual reinforcement of doing for others and self-sacrifice, the character decision to not be loud, to not be powerful, to not be seen, here shaped by the master narratives of gender and class in 1942, right? Here also you begin to see a character in midlife striving to kill off an earlier version of herself, right? I acted in self-defense. Had I not killed her, she would have killed me. So this is the crisis of selfhood in midlife, this structure I've created, this narrative identity I've lived in and through uh, is no longer big enough for me. Uh, no longer fits me and I, I wrestle with trying to escape it. So here narrative identity has become a constriction, uh, a constriction of the human imagination. And here you see in her essay a reach for the imagination, right? Imagining beyond the boundaries of the earlier self story. She hungers for this next version of herself, right? Hungers to be free of the impoverishment of possibility that she feels in her current story of self. Hungers for narrative, freedom, and agency. So th there you have three character structures you're all quite familiar with, maybe talked about in a little bit different light in terms of these literary examples. 
Uh, let, let's, let's shift now, and I, I want to walk you through three leaders uh, um, and their stories. Let's, let's start with Victoria. You know, right away, you notice with Victoria, she's got a lot going on, right? Uh, she's in the 99th or 100th percentile in courageous authenticity, kind of off the charts in uh, purposeful and visionary, achieves results, decisiveness. Uh, she's got nine of the 18 creative competencies above the 90th percentile. When I look at this graph, I see maybe a system that's at its max. I'm not sure where she goes from here, particularly when I look at the rest of the system. Very high leadership effectiveness, uh, strong controlling profile that she underrates to some degree. When I see a profile at age 52, that's this strong in one of those reactive spaces, I wonder about the power inherent in the original formation of that reactive structure. Wonder what was going on in her early life that it's still that powerful for her. Okay? I'm at least hypothesizing that this is telling me something about the formation back in early life. So let me, let me tell you the rest of the story for Victoria. Oldest of four children growing up in extreme poverty in the southwestern United States, growing up in a trailer park. Father was an abusive alcoholic and drug addict. Mother was kind of a sweet but depressive alcoholic. So the household was kind of chaotic with unpredictable violence. On any given day, there could be encounters with the police, threats of violence, shady characters, neglect, abuse, the ever-present fear of being evicted. So little Victoria was the oldest of her siblings, oldest of four. And by the time she was seven, she was the de facto mother of this family, protecting her younger siblings from the rages of her father, insulating them from the soul-crushing neglect of their mother, cooking, cleaning, and protecting and parenting as best she could in her little girl's body. She grew up fast, she grew up hard, and she developed this foundational core that insisted on forward motion, doing the best she could, taking care of those less able, always hiding her own fears and insecurities and anxieties. When Victoria was a freshman in high school, her father finally went to prison permanently after killing a, a guy in a bar fight. Victoria by then was a straight-A student, again, caretaker of her mother and, her, and mother to her younger siblings. Uh, and for the first time in her life, she felt some hope, hope of escape and a life completely different than what she'd known in her first 15 years. And she hooked herself up to that imagined future. Uh, she really fully you know, committed herself to creating that life for herself. So she pursued excellence in all her ende endeavors, uh, piled up kind of achievement after achievement through high school, uh, got, in, uh, got a full ride scholarship at the State University, carried a 4-0 average in college while working full time and still being the matriarch of the family. Career success followed really quickly after college. Uh, she got recruited, she cl climbed up the executive ramp quickly and ended up being the president of several very successful companies. So if there was one conclusion reached by young Victoria regarding sort of surviving her childhood, it was, it was this. So there's her controlling structure again. Conclusion was the world's a dangerous place and it's really not safe to be little. This is a kid who took on an adult role at age seven. Learned how to be big, right? So given that blueprint instruction, if you will, from an identity perspective, given that narrative heart of this story, what strategies emerged? Forward motion at all costs, right? followed by an unassailable escape, followed by an unassailable success. 
relentless pursuit up the achievement ladder, victory at all costs. The challenge for her now in midlife at age 52 is her growing emptiness, exhaustion, and despair. Despite all that she's accomplished in her identity project, she's had a fabulous career, lots of recognition and acclaim. She's made piles of money. She's got a loving husband and family. Why is she not happy? So the story of who she is now has this particular arc, right? Uh, it includes a curated past and a, sort of an explanatory logic to the present and what used to be a comforting imagined future. Problem now she's having is imagining the future because the continuation of life as she knows it right now sounds empty, soulless, um, kind of futile. So these are possible signs of sort of the last gasp of that identity project for her, that egoic structure hanging on. Um, and it's also a look at the cost she's paid all her life for this particular set of strategies. Right? Exhaustion being you know, a, big, a big clue, right? Make sense? Let's meet another leader. This, this is Mason. You see he's in about the 80th percentile in courageous authenticity and strategic focus. Not much shown over here in relating, kind of middle of the road in systems awareness. Uh, the rest of the story is, is shown here. You know, 90th-ish percentile in the three protective domains and very high in autocratic. So again, here's, he's 49 here. This is potentially for me, uh, I'm, I'm curious, what does this mean about that, the origins of this pattern? The fact that this is so strong at midlife, at almost 50. So for Mason, he was the oldest, nope, sorry, no, he was the, uh, he was given up for adoption by, he was a, his mom was a teenage mother, gave him up for adoption. He, uh, he kind of languished in the health, uh, in the state system before he got adopted for about nine months. He was finally adopted by, a, uh, uh, by some parents who had two other adopted children and, and three children of their own, so kind of a big family. Uh, and his parents, his adoptive parents loved him, but sort of within the bounds of their fairly narrow, harsh, sort of moralistic uh, uh, flavor of religion that they had. Uh, so for Mason, love was sort of an isolating contract, almost a conditional contract for some requisite amount of nurturance and care. It's kind of one of those families where if you tow the party line, then nurturance was forthcoming. But any deviance from that, uh, from sort of those narrow family boundaries, around what was to be thought or what was to be felt or what was to be heard was met with either sort of a harsh moralistic rebuke or more often than night sort of a, a silent, um, isolating kind of experience. To compound that, about age 12, Mason began to realize he was gay. So his family surround had zero capacity for that revelation. Um, he was ill-equipped for any serious disclosure with any of his friends, had no role models to offer him advice or solace or counsel. So his life thus far has been a repetition of people not wanting him. First his mother, then the state, then the adoptive family, and now maybe the world, right? So Mason, in his isolation, develops the capacity for solitude, being by himself. He develops an observing and analytical mind. School was super easy for him. Books were his refuge. Uh, the intellectual, loner, outsider persona suited him pretty well. 
If the world didn't want him, he would build a character that didn't need the world. So breezing through college and grad school, he, he developed a reputation for original thought, sort of brilliant analysis, quick wit, withering quit criticism. The big three consulting firms couldn't wait to get a hold of him. Right? But if there was one core conclusion reached by young Mason, it was that it's not safe to want love. And it's corollary, it's probably not safe to love. So here you see uh, very familiar moving away from strategies, right? Um, so given that narrative heart, you can imagine the strategies that emerge for this young man. Smartest guy in the room. Low tolerance for anyone not his intellectual equal. Preference for his own company an active shunning of connection and intimacy bids. Um, so his, his narrative identity is strong, right? Um, that's the other thing you see in his graph. This tells me something about this may be the way he knows himself, right? This may be the most powerful part of his narrative identity. So without movement around that, you're probably not going to see movement for Mason, <laughs> right? The story has to change. The reality for him at midlife at 49 is he's lonely. So that identity blueprint around it's not safe to want love is up against sort of an emerging cousin, which maybe it's dangerous to not have love. And that's the tension he's in at almost 50. And so um, if you're familiar with Rilke's poem, poem, The Night, sort of evokes the despair that he's feeling at this point in his life. So the night rides forth in coal black steel into the teeming world. Outside his armor, everything is there. The sunlight and valley, friend and foe and feast. May, maiden, forest and grail, and God himself in a thousand forms to be found along every road. But inside the armor, darkly enclosing him, crouches death. And the thought comes and comes again, when will the blade pierce this iron sheath, the undeserved and liberating blade that will fetch me from my hiding place where I've been so long compressed, so that at last I might stretch my limbs and hear my full voice. So here again, like the Virginia Woolf essay, you, you have a longing for the death of this earlier self, this compressed self. When will the blade pierce this iron sheath, the undeserved and liberating blade that will fetch me from my hiding place where I've been so long compressed? There's the constriction of the human imagination, right? Okay, final example. Uh, final leader here. This is James. So James is about the 70th percentile you see in, in uh, things like caring connection, collaborator, interpersonal intelligence, uh, selfless leader, integrity. Sort of less impressive over here in the achieving stuff. Uh, the rest of his graph looks like this. So you see, uh, uh, probably not surprisingly, Strong complying structure, kind of middle of the road in terms of effectiveness. Um, so the question, obviously, for me in a lot of these is I wonder what were these origins of this pattern? Okay. The fact that he identifies so strongly with this part of his identity you know, at, at 53, um, I'm curious about that. So for James, he was the middle of three kids, older brother kind of a ne'er-do-well, uh, younger sister had a learning disability that was fairly profound. Um, his mother was kind of a loving, bright spirit, but her brightness kind of ebbed and flowed with, she fought this long sort of trench warfare battle with cancer most of his childhood. 
in and out of the hospital. Uh, Dad was kind of a hardworking guy, but quiet, uh, given to depression, at times kind of a, a crippling cynicism. So dinner table conversation in this household kind of revolved around three things. It was the state of his mother's health on any given day or illness. It was his older brother's drinking drug use and getting in trouble with the law. Or it was his little sister's loneliness and unhappiness and struggles at school with her learning disability. James was a, a frequent witness to mom's buoyant spirit kind of running up against the shoals of dad's kind of depressive outlook on life. Um, he came to dread the aftermath of that because the light in the house would sort of disappear for days. So terrified of losing his mother permanently, terrified of causing her any distress, acutely aware of how much she herself longed for stability and harmony in that family system, James learned how to be a, a very good boy. Right. He was a model citizen, good grades, polite to adults, um, engaging, interested in others, a wonderful best friend, uh, conversational, anything that would keep the house stable, anything that would keep his mother alive, anything that would keep his father from sliding into a crippling depression, anything that would keep his brother out of alcoholism and jail, anything that would keep his little sister from lifelong disappointment. So his desires, his wants, his needs took a back seat to all these other more formidable anxieties. And like Victoria and Mason, his childhood wounds laid the groundwork for his adult capacities. Uh, James is a master of making people feel comfortable, valued, respected, broad circle of friends, many of them thinking of themselves as special in his eyes. So he's like a best friend to multiple people. Um, after high school and after college and grad school, uh, his natural gifts in that relating space made him a rising star in the healthcare world. Um, and if there was one sort of core conclusion that James reached in early life, it was, you know, it's really not safe to rock the boat because the boat he was in was pretty fragile and pretty leaky. That family system um, could go down with all hands aboard at any given moment. So he organized a character structure and a narrative identity around making sure that didn't happen. So you can imagine the strategies that emerge from that character choice, right? A hypervigilance regarding conflict and distress. Caution cloaked in a cheerful disposition. Uh, Self-sacrifice in service of an all-important harmony. A swallowing of voice and personal power. And the reality for James at age 53 is he's, he's angry. He's been told that he's topped out in his career, that he doesn't have the requisite leadership um, capability to advance any further. He's angry and he's tired. He's tired of watching himself swallow his words. He's tired of constantly acquiescing to less capable but more vocal peers. All right? So kind of like Virginia Woolf, he, he's got an impulse to murder that earlier version of himself. He's in a narrative constriction. That old story chafes and compresses. The old story he's told about who he is and how he came to be is comfortable and familiar. He's just not afford, he doesn't, doesn't sure he can afford to believe it anymore. Costs are pretty high. So these are, the, these are the four basically character impetuses for each of these three leaders, right? Building a whole narrative identity around 
not safe to be little. Uh, it's not safe to want love or it's not safe to rock the boat. Carrying those into adulthood as far as we can carry them. <laughs> uh, so you might begin to wonder, well, what, what can we do about this? Well, what I call narrative loosening. How do you help people loosen the narrative? New, loosening the narrative can be done in these three dimensions of the narrative identity, the past, the present, and the future. You know, because narrative identity has its anchors, sort of foundational anchors in that curated past, it's a good place to start. And all the senior work I do, there's one point in that early session as they're getting their feedback and we're kind of going deep, is I do an origins exercise with the team. Um, those of you who are in Melbourne and Brisbane with me know a little bit about this. But basically it's around asking them to think about and reflect on this question. What were the forces, events, and circumstances in early life that shaped my reactive pattern? And then having them share that with each other. So this is an exercise in autobiographical memory. You're asking them to think back biographically in their life to what were those forces, events, and circumstances that have shaped my character. This also has autobiographical reasoning in it, right? Because you're asking them, in a sense, to help explain the present by looking back at the past. So the intent on the individual level is to have them occupy the role of author here, right? Not just protagonist, not just the someone who's living through the story, but someone who's got a little more agency, a little more narrative freedom as they look back. So the intent here, the other benefit of this look back is to open up the doors of empathy to their earlier selves, to see those selves with more compassion and understanding. So for Victoria and Mason and James to see the beautiful logic of those early character choices, to appreciate the powerful shaping influences of those family surrounds, to love their younger characters for their courage and their choices and their tenacity. And to do that is to not only lift whatever judgments they might have about those earlier selves, but also begin to demonstrate some temporal distance between then and now. Okay? That's a subject-object distinction, right? Um, it loosens the presence for the past and allows for some new insight, understanding, and narrative freedom. I mentioned earlier that at certain junctures in life, we feel kind of a developmental tension. It's uh, a tension between what you might think of as your homeostatic self uh, and your evolutionary self. The homeostatic self is the part of you that is oriented towards stability of self, keeping things as they are, avoid, a keen to sort of avoid identity drift. I, I don't know about you, but there are times in my life when I feel pretty content developmentally. I don't have a burning desire to change or grow, or I'm not feeling a lot of developmental pressure, maybe consolidated in my identity at that particular juncture in my life. And my story of self is a suitable fiction for that point in time. I've, I've come to really appreciate those times in my life, because they oftentimes come after some pretty strong developmental work. <laughs> um, but when there's work to be done developmentally, the homeostatic self can be kind of a tough dance partner because they're dancing with the other aspect of self, which is really the evolutionary part of self. That's the part of you that's longing for expansion, that wants to rewrite life's term sheet. Right? The part of self whose emphasis is not stasis, but evolution. So we can kind of pick up Victoria's story here as a way of thinking about this. So Victoria's done some nice look back work. She's contemplated that origins question. Uh, she's connected some new dots in her identity story. She's developed kind of a profound compassion for that earlier little girl in that trailer home. Uh, 
she's got some nice temporal subject object differentiation between her now and her then. Uh, she's found a way to really love and honor that little girl uh, and the beautiful, beautiful logic of, of that little girl's choices. So now it's time for her to work on the constriction she feels in the present. Remember, she feels exhausted uh, a lot, with a lot of despair and not a lot of hope for the future. So if we start with sort of the narrative heart of her original story, it's not safe to be little, and it's sort of subtext there around always be powerful, always be in command, always be victorious. So the typical pattern she's got is when that narrative identity comes under threat, it cues up this whole menu of sort of cognitive and behavioral repertoire, right? Get loud, get big, take charge, inflate the self, push others harder, move forward, work harder, double down, story the, story the threat. And by that, I mean make up a story about that other person that justifies my own behavior. Signal that you're dominant, uh, strategically manipulate, wield as much positional power as you can. Well, that, that works really well, right? Reduces the threat. She's mastered that over 40 years. The insidious part of this is this also reinforces that identity. The more she runs that neurology, the more it reinforces her story of self, that she is that, okay? So part of her being able to see this pattern now, if we, if we transition to sort of the evolutionary self, if she can see that pattern now, outside of it, take perspective on it, then new capacities come online. She's able to see this identity pattern and sort of take its measure. Instead of living through it, she can see it from the outside in. All of you know, in this room know how important it is to help your clients witness themselves in action, right? Well, this is part of what's going on now for Victoria's. She's seeing what she's doing. Uh, and she's seeing maybe, uh, she's able now to, to do some cost confronting. Sees her exhaustion, her sadness, her emptiness as a price she pays for living this particular story. That may feel like a subtle shift, but it's a profound one because with that recognition, she also sees that maybe that sadness and exhaustion is not inescapable inevitability of life, but just a result of this particular way of living her life and, and being overly identified with this part of her story. So Victoria's system runs on signals. She's attuned to certain kinds of signals, as we all are. So a, com you know, a competitive colleague or a subordinate gonna light up her board, right? <laughs> danger, danger, right? Must assert dominance, must get bigger, must make up a story of the threat, uh, must not be seen as small, must not be taken advantage of. So one opportunity she has here is to detune those signals, right? Make them less alluring to her less evocative. Notice them as they come in, but maybe now with curiosity or maybe even amusement. Seeing herself now not reacting or reacting differently. So detuning the signals that are inherent in, whoops, Tigger showed up, in this system. <laughs> that should happen more in life, right? Tigger showing up. So detuning that system opens up the door for experimentation. The more she can detune, not react to all that signals, the more she can begin to experiment with new self, new identity, new behavior, new thoughts. Um, and over time, that creates new pattern, new story, and ultimately new identity. So those developmental moves of the evolutionary self Pattern recognition, witnessing the self in action, confronting the cost, detuning uh, uh, the signals and experimentation all serve to shift the pattern into the past. 
this pattern now just becomes an object for the autobiographical memory. I used to be like that, right? There's temporal distance and identity distance now. Yeah, I recognize that pattern. That used to be part of who I am, not as identified with it anymore. This is what you do with your clients all the time, right? Helping them make those shifts. And now we'll get to Tigger. My, my daughter, Dory, is 26. She's got a master's in literature, master in creative writing, a uh, master's in publishing. Um, we sh really share a love for, for reading and literature and poetry. She's my poetry buddy. Um, we were on a river trip a couple years ago and kind of floating down the river reading poetry and talking about books and stuff. And kind of out of the blue, I'm not sure what we were talking about, she said, you remember that Winnie the Pooh story when Tigger gets stuck in a tree? <laughs> she was a huge Winnie the Pooh fan when she was a little girl. Um, but the story goes, so Tigger's out in the forest doing his Tigger thing, bouncing higher and higher uh, as he goes along. Inevitably, of course, he bounces so high he gets stuck in the top of a tree and can't get down. All of his friends in the forest are there underneath the tree trying to talk to him and help him down. You know, the Kanga and Rue and uh, Eeyore and, and Piglet. Um, and, but to no avail, nobody can help him down until Christopher Robin comes along and Christopher Robin looks up at Tigger and says, uh, hey Tigger, you know, ask the narrator to tilt the book. <laughs> so Tigger turns outward and asks the narrator to tilt the book and then he's able to walk down the edge of the text to the ground. This is brilliant narrative psychology right there. It's the move from being the protagonist in the story who's stuck to being the author and narrator who actually has some power over the construct itself. What would it be like to be able to walk down the text of a story of our own making back to solid ground? So let's, let's spend the last few minutes talking about the future, the last component of the, Ameri of the uh, narrative identity. Though time and time again, you're going to come up against your own narrative identity sort of firmly anchored in one of those master narratives, gender, class, race, nationality, age, you name it. Uh, and at times, gradually or sometimes suddenly, you may begin to feel the smallness of that big story. So that's an invitation, right? It's an invitation for you to rewrite some of that identity that may be embedded in this broader, up till now maybe unseen master narrative. you're looking for and you're helping your clients develop more narrative agency and freedom. Okay. So number two about the future is you ask any novelist and they'll tell you that they don't really know the complete character arc of their characters they're writing. They don't quite know what's going to happen to them as they're writing them. Literature would be pretty boring if you knew what was going to happen to the characters you were reading about. Same is true for you. Uh, so grant yourself, grant yourself some character agency. You know, park your certitude about you know where you're going. Uh, life's a lot more interesting if you kind of enjoy the unfolding of yourself. I'm usually wrong whenever I think I know who I am and who I'm going to be in the future and what I'm going to like or not like. Um, I'm often 180 degrees off. So narrative, uh, grant yourself some agency there. I want to, I want to end, because we're over time, uh, with one last poem. So there's the th three things I'm talking about in terms And De Prima was an American beat poet, one of the few female beat poets. And this is a poem about the imagination and uh, the only war that matters. <clears throat> 
So you cannot write a single line without a cosmology, a cosmogony laid out before all eyes. There's no part of yourself you can separate out saying this is memory, this is sensation, this is the work I care about, this is how I make a living. It's a whole. It's a whole, it was always a whole, you do not make it so. There's nothing to integrate your presence, you're an appendage of the work. The work stems from, hangs from the heaven you create. Every man, every woman, every woman carries a firmament inside and the stars in it are not the stars in the sky. Without imagination, there is no memory. Without imagination, there is no sensation. Without imagination, there is no will or desire. History is a living weapon in your hand. And it is thus that you have imagined it. And it is thus that you find out for yourself. History is a dream of what can be. It's a relationship of things in a continuum of imagination. What you find out for yourself is what you select out of an infinite sea of possibility. No one can inhabit your world. Yet it's not lonely. The ground of imagination is fearlessness. Discourse is a videotape of a movie of a shadow play. But the puppets are in your hand, your counters in a multi-dimensional chess game, which is divination and strategy. The war that matters is the war against the imagination. All other wars are subsumed in it. The ultimate famine is the starvation of the imagination. It's death to be sure, but the undead seek to inhabit someone else's world. The ultimate claustrophobia is the syllogism. The ultimate claustrophobia is it all adds up. Nothing adds up and nothing stands in for anything else. The only war that matters is the war against the imagination. The only war that matters is the war against the imagination. The only war that matters is the war against the imagination. All other wars are subsumed in it. There's no way out of a spiritual battle. There's no way you can avoid taking sides. There's no way you cannot have a poetics. No matter what you do, plumber, baker, teacher, you do it in the consciousness of making or not making your world. You have a poetics, you step, step into the world like a suit of ready-made clothes, or you etch in light. Your firmament spills into the shape of your room the shape of the poem of your body, of your loves. A woman's life, a man's life is an allegory. Dig it. There's no way out of the spiritual battle. The, the war is the war against the imagination. You can't sign up as a conscientious objector. The war of the world hangs here right now in the balance. It's a war for this world to keep it a, a, a veil of soul making. The taste in our mouths is the taste of power, and it's as bitter as death. So bring yourself home to yourself. Enter the garden. The guy at the gate with the flaming sword is yourself. The war is the war for the human imagination. No one can fight it but you, and no one can fight it for you. Imagination is not only holy, it is precise. Men die every day for the lack of it. It's vast and elegant. Intellectus means light of the mind. It's not discourse, it's not even language. The inner sun, the polis, is constellated around the sun. The fire is central. That last line there about the polis being constellated around the sun has haunted me for a lot of years because we all work in these systems and these organizations that are less than ideal. <laughs> um, what would it be like? I mean, the, the polis, the word polis, the Greek word for city-state, usually invoked when you're talking about what would the ideal city-state be? What would it be if we constellated it around the human imagination versus what we really constitu constituted around most of the time in these organizations? So thank you for letting me go longer than I should. Um, appreciate you spending the time. <laughs> Okay, thank you so much. Thank you, Steve. Mm -hmm. That was fantastic.